Welcome back, B-Shifter. So good to have you on this episode of B-Shifter. John Vance, Josh Bloom, Nick Brunacini, hanging out, talking about a few things that face us as fire ground commanders. So we are always in the task, tactical, and more important, strategic world, trying to tie it all together here on B-Shifter. We're with uh, Nick and Josh, and we're talking about after-action reviews. And there's a couple of different components to after action reviews. It's part of our continuous improvement process. We can't get any better unless we identified what we can improve on. So that's one part of it. What is the first part of an after action review, especially while we're on the scene? And how does that work as far as our revising for the future, as far as our command functions go? The after action review is really, you're just describing what happened at the incident. So you're kind of replaying it. So it would begin with the strategic decision-making model. Typically it's the, the IC number one goes through what they did and then uh, kind of how they formulated, uh, chose the right strategy and their uh, corresponding IAP. And then they describe kind of that initial operation of the first few companies. And then, there's a transfer, the BC picks it up then, and they kind of continue on. This is what happened before I got here. This is what I kind of saw when I got here, and then this is was my plan afterwards. So that's, that's kind of the format we used. Yeah, so I think the blue card system provides that radio com board or dispatch form, if you will, that – walks through that initial radio report, follow-up report, assigning a couple companies, command transfer. So not that you need that in front of you, but I think that that walks you really through what Nick just described as the process of what was going on, what did you do, what did everybody else do, and it's an opportunity to identify and get out the truth, I think, which is a big part of it, not some made-up story two or three or five days later. And, John, like you said, I think it's a – opportunity to try to fix something right there i mean you can identify you can identify some sort of uh something that didn't go right maybe you can fix that there so when if the bell rings in five minutes you don't do the same thing again well i think there's a what was supposed to happen and what actually happened and you juxtapose those two together and then that that is part of that review so you do that on the tailboard you, you do that, you know, wh- wherever you can on the scene, if you can on the scene. I think there's some rules of thumb even about doing it on the scene. You want to make sure the media is not around. You want to make sure the homeowner isn't really there, the person who did, who had the loss, you know, whoever that is. Um, I think Chief used to talk about excessive celebration or he had something, you know, we don't, we don't want to be high-fiving. And, even though we might have done well, the, the public doesn't understand why we're happy after they had a loss. So we have to be careful for that because that can be misunderstood, right? And then it's it's drilling down to, okay, engine one, you took the line, you went in through the alpha side, yada, yada. But then you start to pick out some of the things that you would do different next time. You could. I mean, it just reinforces that standard condition, standard action, standard outcomes. So it, <clears throat> keeping it clinical was what I found to be the best, most disarming thing. And typically, like, half the fires I responded to as a response chief, I didn't take command of if I got there first because they had the fire out, right? So the fire's knocked down. There's there's an all clear. There's an under control. Five minutes into the thing, seven minutes, the BC shows up, and it's like, well, there's nothing to take command of. My routine would be to, first of all, get on the scene, announce my arrival, and then I would uh, declare if I was going to take command or not, because we responded with multiple chiefs. And if you didn't, then like the next battalion would get there and take it and start screwing shit up that you didn't want to see. So if the first and I see had pretty much everything done, get on the scene, hey battalion, whoever on the scene <clears throat> to command, I'm going to leave it with you. Cancel the next in chief. So you, you're kind of. See, and that was a big deal because that notified everybody that was listening to the radio that this thing is pretty much done. We're finished. 
We're not going to be adding any more units to it. Uh, the hazard zone part of this thing is behind us. So in those kind of things, and this is half of them, <clears throat> we'd park out of the way. I'd get out of the rig and go socialize with people for four or five minutes, ten minutes, whatever it was. Hey, how you doing? Blah, 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 blah. And then before we would break it down and terminate command, we'd get together for a couple minutes, like you said earlier, in a place that we were kind of had some privacy. And sometimes the critique only took, Five minutes. I mean, it was like, hey, you had this, this. And so, like, if you have a one- or two-line fire, and they said, this is what we had, this is what we did, I mean, that's just a kind of reaffirming that, hey, you did an excellent job, well done, this was this is what it was supposed to sound like. I was coming in, and this is what I expected. You know, we had a thermal column as we were responding, and I was halfway here, and it was just all white conversion. So, you guys, X, Y, and Z, boom. <clears throat> so, really what it did is... In that sense, it just kind of validated the actions, the effective actions they took. and But socially, it kind of put us together as the same group of people. It, it, is it became an interaction that was positive for both them and me. So it wasn't, oh, the goddamn chief's here, blah, blah, blah. Oh, no, oh, Nick is here. This will. So you, you're really kind of one of the workforce then, and that's kind of the way you want them to see you. It's like, okay, this is, yeah. If it wouldn't have gone out, he would have taken command and just continued this way. So it, it, it serves both those purposes. At least that's the way I used it. And it was it was pretty good that way. As you could, uh, it became a way to socially connect to the people that you were responsible for. So I think j just to agree with, follow up with what you said about confirming that people were doing what they were supposed to or the right thing. I think that that positive reinforcement goes a long way because. We all have it within organizations where somebody's a naysayer, they don't agree with something, or they don't like the way that something went. And when you can go through it and have that positive reinforcement that crews did exactly what they were supposed to do, and we ended up with a, a the outcome that we were looking for, that standard action, standard conditions for that, and then we end up with some sort of a standard outcome, that that, that, that shuts that up, and then people start to you know, align a little bit better also like, Oh, this, this is the way that it's going to be. Mm -hmm. Well, this became just another part of the relationship we had. Cause we would train together. It, 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 the BCs did a lot in the way of like company training and things like that. So you had a bigger role in the, like the daily activities going on. So doing just making sure a post incident critique went on was just kind of the, the you were completing the circle on that whole thing. And just kind of validating what we had talked about a lot of times in the last training. Now, when we were going through the recovery process and we were starting to make some wholesale changes, the critiques became even more important. Because that's where you would see we were changing things that affected what a, a strategic level officer was doing. And so it wasn't uncommon to respond to a scene where, like, that didn't happen the way that we had talked about in the training session before. So now you have a situation where, okay, all the workers on the task level know that the BC didn't do what they were supposed to do, and now the BC's boss is there, and how is this going to get processed? Well, you would <clears throat> pretty much most of the time just do the same thing and say, hey, in the future, this is what we agreed to, and this is what we're doing, and this didn't happen here. And, I mean, that happens with all of us at some point or another. It, 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 and in fact, I found that like critiques is the most, uh, the hardest critics are the individuals themselves. It is they'll tell you, this is all the shit I did wrong. Mm -hmm. I should have done this. I did, I did this instead because of this, this, and this. Well, a lot of time it's like, yeah, I can see why you would think that. that that's, you know, that's why we do a 360 or, you know, you did that because we missed this element. And so we're using critiques to make us better, that's where that really gets brought out in the wash of the whole thing. And, and then, see, but other, all the people in the critique start to see that. Oh, this is what improvement looks like. This isn't about me. You know, I may have missed something, but this is the system. And so we have these kind of little routines we go through that make us more successful. That's what a lot of it is. What Josh was talking about were people like, no, 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 I'm going to do this for my own benefit. Those are people that need a little tighter leash to be tugged on. Yeah, since you said that, I'll, I'll say this: these words that we, can, we could expand upon, but 
it's this whole learning piece of the after action review is really operant conditioning. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we support good behavior mm-hmm. and we correct the bad behavior and give the direction on this is what we expect to happen. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's funny you said the leash thing because, you know, that's a big, like, yeah, here if, we're, if we were training a dog, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, you're good. I'm going to give you a treat, or mm-hmm. you get something for that. And if it's you're not, then you're not going to get this treat until you do what you're supposed to do. So it's an opportunity to fix things and get it the way that we want it to be. But it's a, it's a it's a learning system, right? It's a way that we learn and do better and can and do better so that we have a better outcome to get that standard outcome. You know, Big Al used to call that uh, giving Mongo a cookie. <laughs> Mongo, do good. Here's cookie. Oh, Mongo, happy. <laughs> Mongo just pawn in Game of Life. <laughs> That's right. Mongo loves Sheriff. <laughs> you know, one of the things that in order for people to self-diagnose what you brought up, which is very powerful, and that's part of an organizational culture, people have to feel safe to, to do that. So this di- self-diagnosis has to be non-punitive, right? I mean, the, the whole idea is you're not going to kick a subordinate or somebody in the kneecaps because they admit like, hey, man, I didn't get that water supply on the way in or I didn't, I didn't do what I was supposed to do because of, you know, they, they have whatever reason. But when, when they can self-diagnose and they're in that safe culture to be able to do that, that's the most – we don't have to even open our mouths as a fire chief, right, or as a chief officer – presiding over that they they've done it for us yeah so, <clears throat> we would use critiques uh in some instances to fix stuff that that we couldn't fix in a critique so you're identifying a set of things one of the best examples that we dealt with were ambulances is we had fire department ambulances staffed by young firefighters <clears throat> well what would happen is when there was a structure fire, see, the busiest units in our fire department were ambulances. There's 30 of them, and they were always going somewhere, taking sick people to the hospital. So they're in between either going to the hospital or coming back from the hospital, and you spit out a structure fire. Well, it wasn't uncommon that, like, you would have a 2,000-square-foot house reported to be on fire that you would end up with, like, six or seven ambulances that would add themselves to that call. So that became an issue. And they said, well, you can't have all these people adding in this and that. And, it, and you'd have two or three engines that would add. Sometimes you would take like three engines, one ladder, a couple chiefs, and an ambulance. And there would be, you'd double it just with people adding. Oh, I'll get there. It's a fire. We're all going. Well, everybody would pound their chest about that. You shouldn't be doing this. And I thought, well, you know, they're going to do it. They're going to do it. If you stage, it ain't that big a deal because you're not in the way yet. It's the ones that just come into the scene and freelance that become the issue. Well, engines and ladders in our system didn't do that because if that happened, that was going to be dealt with immediately and probably by the companies that were already assigned or the ones that were still staged. And there was more than once before we could do the critique, we had to disarm companies with Halligan tools going after other companies that were the cowboys. So, anyway, you would get these ambulances and they're like, well, it's just the two of us and we're with our engine and we got to deal with our captain that we don't have to say anything on the radio. And it's just assumed that we're going to be with them. Well, we had issues where at fires, we would change the strategy and uh, you'd be defensive for like 10 minutes and all of a sudden you'd see like heads walk past the window inside the building, firefighters. Who the hell is that? Well, it's an ambulance. So we had a, An issue with freelancing ambulances. And we tried to deal with it in like a post-incident critique thing, just on a case-by-case basis with the AMBO crews and say, you can't do this anymore. Well, their first reaction is, oh, we can't go on fires. No, you can't freelance. See, you don't understand the difference between those two things. Going on a fire don't piss any of us off. You freelancing infuriates us. (laughs) Stop doing that. Well, but this is my captain. I think, oh, I understand. We had a meeting. There was a group of shift commanders and blah, blah, blah. Four of the six of us, this was a big issue. 
So we just decided to have a meeting with all the captains. Call If you have an ambulance in your station, you're coming to this meeting on this day. And we told the captain, stop doing that. If you're going to go into a fire with your ambulance, just say it over the radio. You just have to let us know so we know they're there. <clears throat> this ain't to keep them out. It's just so we can track them. Oh, that's it. Oh, yeah, that's it. <clears throat> so they, it was. <clears throat> it allowed us to fix that problem. And I'm t- after... Three meetings, it stopped. And you started hearing it over the radio. Well, the alarm room took advantage of that, the dispatch center, because they hated them going because they wanted to keep them in service because they're ambulances. I drop off the call, drop off the call. So then you had to broker some kind of peace between them doing their nonsense. You're like, no, we're trying to fix this, and you're just accelerating everybody being mad at one another. So it, it, there was a lot of management that went around with that. It was a very powerful tool for uh, strategic level officers to correct things in a way that look like you said, is it's not threatening. It's like, this is, and usually like you're just walking the, the employee to that decision. Most of them know it right off the bat. If they don't, it may take a little while to educate them. But at what point do you go from the, the tailboard critique to a, a more formal after action review or critique where you're sitting down in a room, you're looking at pictures, you're listening to radio traffic and you're really dissecting. Uh, what, what, what point do you do that? So I think there's something even between those two that is, that is a documented piece that that first do company officer, that initial IC and probably that first do strategic IC battalion that they do together. That's a, just some simple form piece of, really starts with a bunch of the eight functions of command pieces, but what did, what did that deployment look like? And our, <laughs> it really digs into how long is it t- taking us to really get out the door? And are we getting out the door? And how often is the first due company not available in their first due? And then breaking down the initial radio report a little bit further. You know, what went good, what didn't go so good? Just, uh, just a couple people having that discussion and reviewing that. And really, it's more of like a self-evaluation piece. So I think there's, I mean, there's a bunch of forms, you know, documented all over the place. And it's not like it takes you all day to do it. You can listen to 10 minutes of radio traffic, fill this thing out, and it gives you a place to start, right? And and then I think you can start to see some trends in certain things with with how long did it take to respond? How long did it take for them to get out the door? What was the time on the road? What How long did it take the second company to get there? Was there a delay in that Um so I think that's another piece of it that even on the tailboard critique, that was a kitchen fire that you still do that documented form piece, because I think we start to see things in that oftentimes that we see at the bigger events. So if we can document and fix something there, that's a trend that we could fix in training, it'll probably help us later. And then I think we end up in the multiple companies we're working at a fire event that expanded and we end up with some sort of a, a formal review. But to get to that point, you have to have had the tailboard and you have to have started that what went good and what didn't so good, didn't go so good. And then uh, that's really the video, if you will, of the Friday night football game. And then what you're talking about, John, I think, is that we're sitting at the table and we're talking about all of those pieces, which is what you do Saturday morning. Like, let's watch the film from the Friday night game, or we played on Saturday. Let's watch the film on Sunday of what happened yesterday. What did we do good? What didn't go so good? How can we improve that? Is there a training problem? Are we seeing a continuous issue with whatever it is that we need to train on with everybody? Or is this an isolated problem? So I think it it, it depends on uh, how far the incident escalates. I think the other part of that, you kind of mentioned it, is if if we use critiques, to improve operations, like total quality improvement, whatever the hell you want to call it, <clears throat> then the people who are responsible for making sure the critiques happen have to have some kind of hand in training because that's how you fix operational issues, especially if it, it's, it's like the AMBO example. They, no, man, this, is, this isn't isolated somewhere. This is happening everywhere, and it's got to be fixed now because it's going to lead to something that's really shitty eventually. I don't know that that's nobody's fault. You know, it just kind of grew out of the system. So you're like, no, we have to. So it's one of the, 
I don't know, the senior response people, that becomes your job to fix those things and say, no, this, is the, this interrupts our normal effective operation is, is this kind of deal. And I, when you explain that to people, they understand it. It's if you can't explain it to them and say, this is why this is screwed up and we need to tweak it this way, then you, you don't have the right answer yet. It's got, it's got to work to tell B shifters, don't do that, do this. Oh, thank you. Nick, working with that critique in your system, how much involvement would you have with your mutual aid or auto aid companies to be a part of the critique after the fact? Would they, would they participate in that? And yeah. then if they do, how, how do you go about being diplomatic and pragmatic at the same time? Well, there were challenges because whenever like the incident happened in another city and like half the units there were theirs and the other half were from our department, let's say. Well, it's their, you, it's their incident because it happened in their community. But we wouldn't necessarily, if there were lessons to be learned, we would critique it anyway because we were there. So that, that was the other part of it. We worked together seamlessly, but there was still, we wore different uniforms from one another and there was a, there's always going to be some of that it is we're one cult and they're another cult and we get together when we respond together but so that's pretty much the way we would do it if and we would welcome them into our critiques if they were responded to it and say this is i mean we pretty much just sent it out so it was almost like command training is command training we offered up to anybody in the automatic aid consortium we would do the same thing with the critique Josh, how about you? What do you what do you do? For like ten years, I went to every critique that our fire department was engaged in in town or out of town, and you know, you we really couldn't force or anybody to show up. Um, our best opportunity to get information and to fix it was the tailboard, and then to document it right after the day before you leave shift, and then to try to put that information out that became that after action crew report where you could have a tabletop because uh, you would just have to share it because people weren't necessarily showing up. Uh, in my experience, when I showed up to a lot of after action reports, you know, three days later when the next time that they're on shift or a week later, the next time they're on shift or whatever was um, nobody would say anything because you were in the room with three or four other fire departments and nobody had anything to say. Everybody was thinking something, but nobody would say anything. So the best way to really fix it was to put it out on the table. Here's the, here are the findings. This is what happened. This is what everybody said happened. Here are the shortfalls or here's the things that we need to fix. Here's the opportunities, if you will, to get better and just, just share that with people, which and smaller groups would go, you know, round and round and, you know, ops chiefs or training people would talk to each other about what they're going to do. But, you know, when the, when four, per, four people from that engine showed up and four people from that truck showed up and four people from this engine showed up and that medic unit showed up at a after action review, it was a, it was a show, it was a social and nobody had anything to say about the event necessarily, but I, I didn't go to too many events. I don't think many, many of us go to too many events where there's not an opportunity to do something a little bit better. Not like a big aha, like, holy shit, we got to fix that. But like something that we could do better, but we would, I guess it's like sheltering. We would just kind of, people would just kind of protect themselves. Like, I don't have anything to say. Like, I'm just ready to go back and get out of here and do whatever I need to do. Um, so don't evaluate me. So I think that's the piece of, you got to get the tailboard piece. And then you got to document, you know, what if you're going to fix something, then you got to document it like right now, what happened right before you, before you leave shift, what went good, what didn't go so good. And then if you're going to put something out, you know, putting that out and just sending it out to the people and not saying you don't have an after action and have people come into the room where everybody can talk about it and draw it out. But I, I seldom saw many outcomes from that. I, I'd end up seeing more where people would just take stuff and then, a few weeks later, you would hear about, oh, they didn't do a 360 on that building fire, and they didn't have their thermal imaging camera, and we identified that as a problem, and we said that they need to do something with it. And then you see something from that organization. It's like, oh, yeah, we're going to, in the next month, we're going to be doing these trainings on 360s, and we're going to do more with thermal imaging cameras. And it's like, we still got the same out. We, we, we got what we wanted out of it. We're, we're working on it, and we're going to improve on it without having to have the, what Nick said, oh, they were 
blaming me or they said I did something wrong or it's my fault because we don't look for continuous improvement. It's never my fault. And I didn't do anything wrong. It's your fault. It's not me. It's you. So it's like, uh, I think there's a, but there, there's, there's multiple different ways to do that internally in an organization, you know, let's sit around the table. Let's talk about it and put the players in the room. And I did have the experience of having people that would self report. Hey, I went to this run. I did this. We didn't do that. And we should have, I'm just letting you know. Excellent. It, they're going to self correct, right? You don't even have to bring it up. I had a uh, critique that we did and there were several points that were way off on this incident. And a mutual aid acting officer who was up for a lieutenant's promotion was in the room and he got very defensive right away because his chief, his battalion chief was also in the room and he thought he wouldn't get the promotion if he self reported on what actually happened there. So I, I kind of mentor this guy. I took him aside afterwards and said, you've got to identify this. That shows your strength. <laughs> that shows that you're aware. If you're trying to hide it, and, and the report was it was a basement fire in a hoarder house, and he said, we have the fire all knocked down. That was the radio report. They were the only interior company. So we said, we assume when you say that, that you're, you're getting ready to look at all seven sides and the fire's out. And the fire had actually communicated down the hall and, and it ended up being coming in a defensive fire. It wasn't to throw stones at that guy. It was so that our organization understood the terminology. We can better educate our mutual aid partners on the terminology and just come to understand how to operate better. You know, the worst thing I ever hear is the fire went out. No one got killed. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is the biggest complacency statement I can hear. Because, we, you know, I don't know about your department, but my department doesn't go to enough fires to, to be experts at it. We, we have to pick them apart and figure out what we're going to do better next time, every time. We should be looking for continuous improvement. We review like 75, I don't know, or percent, maybe or more EMS reports, Q&A. Yeah. And you say we wanna, we're going to review one fire, and it's like, what? What do you mean we're going to review that? It's like when we do these reviews – it's about service delivery, but I look at it most important. It's about us. Like it's about doing better for what we do for our people and the service that we provide and keeping our people working so that they can collect their pension when they retire. Those Q and a reports we do are for service delivery for the people that we provide service to, but we take Q and a for EMS more serious than we do a Q and a for a fire incident or a hazmat incident or a rescue incident or, or whatever it is. And yep. that, that, that's typical, that's typical fire service global. It seems it certainly because is. the EMS group has rules and they're driving that bus and there's no rules for the fire department. The authority jury having jurisdiction gets to decide. And it's like, nobody's going to tell us what to do unless it says EMS. And then they tell us exactly what we're going to do and what we're not going to do and how we're going to do it. And we'll accept it. How do we record the key points off the either, whether it's the uh, tailboard critique or, or a, a more formal after action review critique, how do we record the key points and institutionalize that? So that information gets passed to other shifts and on down the line in the fire department. So, I mean, I think it starts with the whole recording. What, what are we trying to track? and having some sort of a document for that. And that document, if we really want to track it and, and come up with like, what are these statistics? What are we seeing over and over again? Then we need to, that form document, whatever it is, has to have some sort of a report connected to it. So we're seeing a trend that, uh, on multiple after action reports, we're having a radio problem. We're having a communications problem. Communications doesn't sound like it should. People aren't talking on the radio. The radio communications isn't clear. And well, when we got like 10 or 15 or 20 or how many ever of those, and we're seeing this trend, then it's been documented. And in this report, we can look and it's like, what's the top 10 things that we're seeing over and over again at these incidents? Well, those are some things that are uh, clearly identifying themselves that we identified, but that are in this report that these are the things that we need to fix. We're 
everybody's not doing it. We're not doing a 360. We're the thermal image camera was on the truck. The company officer was on the wrong radio channel. Failure to recognize the conditions that we have wind driven fire type. Uh, failure to recognize the fire conditions, which just all lines up to the critical factors, which is connected directly back to the strategic decision making model, right? So, I mean, I think identification of that, being honest with each other, and then getting enough documents that's like, well, what's the trend? What do we see? What does that really look like? Big one with us lately has been division operations. And it's, it's because we're still expanding that in my area. And it's divisions understanding how to work with each other and communicate with each other, coordinate the IAP with each other along with the IC. And that's just one of the areas we've identified for improvement. Because, and, and oftentimes we're saying, maybe we should just have one attack position. Maybe we're setting up too many. And I, I'm talking on residential, large residential buildings, mm-hmm. five, 6,000 square feet. Maybe it's just better to have one attack position because the two divisions end up doing the same thing. But those are good discussions. That's going to that's gonna refine our process. We had a fire once. and uh, Basically what happened is the mother was crazy, and she set the kids on fire. Right? So we respond to this thing, comes in as a house fire. <clears throat> and you start to figure out pretty quickly, this is not an ordinary house fire. <clears throat> the initial engine company pulls a line. They knock the fire down. They see some victims in there. They're going into the house to do a quick search. <clears throat> They're starting to extricate the victims from where they were. They end up going into the backyard. And the mother's there, and she's just doused herself in gasoline and set herself on fire. Mm. So firefighter puts her out. She's extinguished. She re-douses and reignites and starts chasing them. So, I mean... So you can imagine. So now they're 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 doing treatment on the young children and the mothers smoldering in the front yard. And it's, so it's a shit show of the first order, man. You 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 just can't believe it. And <clears throat> of all things, I was working a shift trade on C shift. So I thought this is the whole shift's going to go home now. There, there's that's just what's going to happen. So we did an after incident review. At it, it, uh, a fire station, it, it, and it was you know because they're transporting people and they're all coming back and now the goddamn police are there and they want to interrogate firefighters. You're like get get out of our building. So anyway, as we get all the principals in a room and we start going over what happened at this incident, well, half of them are like, no, I shouldn't have done my task. I should have gone in here and done this. And you said, no, that's not what you should have done. This was set up enough. So after, I don't know, it was probably about 15, 20 minutes we sat there and just talked about when you got here, this is what was happening. These were the only actions you could have taken. Boom, boom, boom. By the end of that, I mean, it was, they were almost like a different group of people. There was no hyperventilating. There was, there was no emotional breakdowns. It was like, oh, yeah, this really happened. For me, I, I got to the point that, well, this was going to happen whether any of us were here or not. This group was on this train for a long time. We just happened to be the lucky ones that answered the 911 call. So we're more concerned over what we saw, not what really happened. That's what we're processing now. So it, uh, it allows you to exercise all those demons in a place where you could make sense of this is what we were here to do. This is what we did. In fact, we're the only reason one of the people are alive today. You should take some kind of uh, pride in that. So that <laughs> I think for like your mental health, that is the only way to save it is to say this is what we had and this is what I did. It, it wasn't my fault. I was part of the solution, not the problem. Well, and as the boss, you know, when you're looking around at everybody, when you're doing one of those, who's not right that you might need to follow up mm-hmm. and say, hey, how's Bob doing? How's what's going on with that guy? Because I've done it before on rescues. We do it all the time. Mm-hmm. I mean, because that's a lot more high intensity than our kitchen fires are. Yeah. And you look around and you know, what do you do? What do you do? What do you guys, you know? did everything that we should have done. You reassure the companies, you, you, you talk to them about it and it's a check-in, right? To make sure that they're doing okay. 
And uh, if they're not, getting them some help. Well, and, you know, and there's any na- number of incidents that call for that. But uh, drownings, we had, and living in Phoenix, have an inordinate amount of drownings. You would have these roundtables with companies where you would have, I don't know, multiple drownings in the same pool. And it, you get done, and, and it's just kind of the standard company line is, you know, if you're not, if you, if you guys need to, you can take the rest of the shift off. Basically, you crazy? No, go home. Uh, uh-uh. I'm staying here. At least you understand this. <laughs> you know, you guys were talking about your little dust up last night with the all the emergency vehicles. Another mile away, twelve years ago. <clears throat> boom, boom, boom. A couple cops get shot. Right. So we go to the hospital, and this happens during the day. So it is the most emotionally explosive thing I've ever been a part of. And so you got widows coming in and you can hear this five miles away, the shriek and the whole thing. And so we get done with this and we do our deal with our crews. And they're like, you know, they're, they're, they're just they want to get away from it. They want to go back to a safe place. And, you know, and so I'm talking to a couple of these cops in the parking lot. And I said, what are you guys doing? I said, well, we're going back to work. What? No, we're going back to work. We're going to go write tickets. And you, you think you are armed and ready to go, and you're, they're putting you back in a car? Whole group of them, man. And you think of this is <laughs> there's going to be some violence tonight. <clears throat> you're asking for trouble. Oh, it's pretty tough. Mm. Well, I think that if, you know, if you're looking out for your people, as we're talking about the mental aspect of this, if you're looking out for your people, you're really looking out for your department and that's going to make it safe to self diagnose. It's going to make it safe for them to talk about things when, when it is a shitty situation, they're going to bring it up. They're going to be honest with you. And then we're going to improve and go on with our day. And if we need to be out of service, we need to be out of service. I think that's one of the things we recognize now for us that we, unlike the cops in that situation, we're, we're going to mark our companies out of service. I mean, we may not be back in for the, the rest of the shift. No, there were two people who went home that day after that call. And I could have told you before that incident, if you would have gave me a roster, who's going home? I was like, that person and that person, just because they're going to take free time if it's offered to them. Mm-hmm. You know, this isn't them having an emotional problem and having to think through things. This is them going home and uh, or going wherever they go and being able to do whatever they want to do. Tying flies. Yes. So let's do a timeless tactical truth. Favorite part of the show, timeless tactical truth. The four of spades and the name of the IMS game is helping internal and external humans be safe, successful, and connected with their own empowered control. Kind of apropos to what we were talking about. We're our own leader, basically. Building systems that put people in charge of, everybody says it. We want officers who can make decisions. That's what the, it's the reason you train people. That's so they can make a better decision than had they not been trained. Maybe this is 101 times. We want thanking firefighters, company officers, and chiefs on the fire ground working within a system. I think that answers the question question it all ties together and that wraps up this episode of b shifter if you liked what you hear please subscribe tell a friend share it with people we appreciate that all of our information in the notes if you want to contact us didn't quite agree with something you heard or like to ask a clarifying question we always love to hear from you until next time thanks for listening and please be safe